So in prior videos, you learned how to make a multiple linear regression. You learned how to add categorical variables. And as you can see, what I've got here uh, are the set of dummy codes that we created in a prior video to represent these categorical variables. Sex and smoker, those were easy. Those were dichotomous. Region, we had four regions, and we always do the number of possible group values minus one. We got our dummy codes for those. And then I've got my other numeric variables that didn't need changes. You may also uh, have seen a prior video where we went through and made a mathematical transformation on charges to make it uh, to remove the skewness and help us to put together a valid MLR. I'm going to ignore that for now and just keep this video very simple. What we want to do is check for one more, the final uh, assumption of a multiple linear regression or numeric to numeric relationships and statistics based on the central limit theory, central limit theorem. We, uh, we need to make sure that there's no multicollinearity among our independent variables. So for starters, let's recreate our uh, MLR that we had before. So I'm not going to worry about the math transformation or anything. I'm just going to uh, grab charges as my Y variable. Grab everything else as my X. Children, shift control, left down. Make sure labels are checked, output range. Let's put it in K2, okay. Go back to top, there we go. So this is the same output that we had before, 75% uh, uh, R squared. And we've got our coefficients here for each of these variables. Now, the assumption is that these variables are not too highly correlated with each other. Let me highlight these numbers, these PWs. Everything we like to keep track of. Bold, format, number. Oops. Okay, there we go. So our assumption is that these variables are independent from each other. Now, what does it mean to be not too highly correlated? Well, let's start by just throwing a correlation matrix over the top of these things. Okay, data analysis, correlation, okay. Uh, let's grab A1 through H. Now, again, I'm only doing this with the uh, features or independent variables. And if you created a correlation matrix already from the prior video that we did together, then you don't need to do this again. Um, it doesn't matter that that one still includes charges in it. It's no big deal. All right, so here's our correlation matrix over here. And we're interested in making sure, or this is one way to measure how highly correlated whoops, these values are. Now, it's not the best way, but we can sort of eyeball this and see, all right, well, 7%, uh, let's see, what's the highest one we find? That might be it, 13% right here, 13, 14%. Now, that's the highest it looks like on here, BMI with Northwest and Northeast. None of those are too high. I can tell you already we're not going to have a problem with, with uh, multicollinearity, but it's not enough just to look at these correlation variables. Why? Because of the same reason that we like an MLR over right, simple individual correlations. It's because these coefficients, if we just look at a correlation, we get an isolated view of the effect of sex on charges it doesn't account for the overlap with all of the other variables. And that's not what we want. We want to understand multicollinearity uh, in terms of how much is sex correlated, not just with smoker, but with all of them at the same time. And remember, this is kind of related when we made dummy codes. Remember how we had southeast in there along with southwest, northwest, northeast? And it gave us an error because that variable was essentially perfectly correlated with the combination of these three variables. And it, it was so, because it was perfectly correlated, add an error to our model and we couldn't include it. So we want to avoid a situation where any one of these is too highly correlated with the rest of them. Not necessarily perfectly correlated, of course we don't want that, but even if they're just higher than they should be, we want to get rid of that. Well, how do we measure that? What's our cutoffs? Well, you know, the correlation matrix is one way, but like I said, it's not perfect. So we're going to do something else. Now, again, just to clarify, 
we're not concerned with how correlated these variables are with charges. That's actually what we just did right here. That's the purpose of this whole model. We want the features to be correlated with the label. In fact, we, that's measured by R squared right here. We want this to be as high as possible. What we want to minimize is how much these are correlated with each other. So here's how we measure it. There's a, um, a measure, a metric called variance inflation factor, VIF. And it's a very simple calculation. It's one divided by one. Uh, I'm gonna put a parenthesis here. One minus the R squared of a given feature. Now let me explain what I mean by that. Here I've got my OCD. I've got to make sure that's superscript. There we go. Beautiful, all right. So what does it mean? What do I mean by the R squared of a feature? So here's what we're going to do. Our uh, VIF is going to apply to this list of features, not to charges, only to the features. And we're going to create a value for it right here in this column. And we're going to paste them down the list right here. So in order to calculate a VIF, we need to get an R squared value individually for each one of these features. That's going to be the R squared when this feature is predicted by all of the other features. Just like this whole model tells us how much overlap there is with charges, we want to find out how much these variables overlap with sex, for starters. And that's what VIF tells us. Now, it's on a different scale. It's not, we don't just look at R squared. We look at this 1 divided by 1 minus R squared. So the 1 minus R squared uh, basically tells us what's left over to explain. Um, and then it's 1 divided by that. So anyway, here's what we're going to do. Let's start by making a model to predict. I'm going to actually come over here to children first. Let's predict children and another model down here. And then let's just plug in this formula here with the R squared that we get. All right, so data analysis regression. And now our input range is going to be, oh, I always do that. Delete, it's going to be children. Input X range is going to be all the other variables but children. BMI down. Okay, let's put this one a little further down, like right here. Okay. All right, so here's the R squared I get for this model. I'm going to start copying these. I'm going to make an R squared column right here just so I can keep track of these numbers so I can keep overriding my, my summary outputs. So I'm going to put sex right there. And what I want you to do now is uh, pause the video, and I will too, and let's go through, well, maybe I'll do one more with you, and then I will pause it. So in order to predict BMI now, so I've got my children, R squared. In order to get my BMI, remember, I've got to have all my other variables be cont uh, contiguous here in Excel. So I'm going to cut this and paste it over here on the side of children. All right, so now with BMI over here, I can just rerun the same thing over again. Data analysis, regression, leave all the same settings in here. Okay. Yep, overwrite exactly this part down here. There we go. Now I've got the R squared for, oh, I put it in the wrong spot, didn't I? That's for, oh, I put both in the wrong spot. This was meant to be the R squared for BMI, and this is meant to be the R squared for children. Sorry about that. Okay, so let's just keep going through and doing that. I guess we won't pause it. You can do it at the same time and listen to me talk here. Insert. This one's for age. Oh, before I do that. Now, dichotomous variables, this doesn't really, well, it can't apply. Uh, insert anyway. Let's 
Let's see, did I do that one right? Northeast, how did I miss that one? Oh yeah, look at that. So this just goes to show what, right here, one more reason why we can't use the correlation matrix. We thought our biggest correlations right here were about negative 13%, but our R squared ended up being, and so that's a relatively small correlation, right? But our R squared, when we predicted against all other variables, ended up being 34%, 34.7. It's one more good reason why we test VIF and don't just rely on a correlation matrix when determining uh, multicollinearity. All right, we keep going. Last one. All right. So I can save myself a little bit of time by uh, going through and finding the largest R squared among these. Because if I start there, if that VIF is small enough, then I know the rest of them are also going to be small enough based on my formula up here. So let's apply this formula right down here in the VIF section and looks like our highest right here is 34.9 percent. So I'm going to say equals one divided by, oops, divided by one minus the R squared for this features model. So this again, this is the model I made where Northwest was the label and everything else were the features. And again, I'm never including charges in any of those. All right, VIF 1.53, that is crazy low. We like that. Uh, VIF cutoffs, um, there's, it depends on who you talk to. Uh, we say, uh, I'm gonna use the most strict requirement for VIF. Um, strict would be that VIF should be below 3.0. Um, cut off. Sometimes I'll see moderate ones that say VIF should be below 5.0. Um, but I've also seen some go all the way up to 10. Uh, anyway, I don't need to type all that out. So we like below 3. Below 5 is acceptable. Uh, definitely needs to be below 10. I've also seen seven. Again, it kind of depends on who you talk to. But uh, the lower, the better with the VIF score. So anyway, now that we see that this one's okay, we know that all the rest are gonna be something lower than that. We just go ahead and copy it down and copy it back up anyway. You can see, there we go. Our multicollinearity looks good, meaning we have very little of it, meaning that our independent features our, our independent variables or our features are not too highly correlated to come up with a valid model predicting charges. So that's it for multicollinearity.